are so many legends in this building today. Legendary. Well, today we have someone who is a dear friend, and he definitely qualifies when you use the word legend, but I know him well enough to know that he's too humble to accept that designation. He has been working for many years at the highest level in so many different ways as a lawyer, manager, a and R head of a record label. Uh, I'm just lucky enough to call him my friend. So today we have David Massey, who currently is the president and CEO of Arista. And at, at my core, I really do have a select group of people that when I think through my time working in this business, they always bring a smile to my face. And David is in that list. So David, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Kevin. I always enjoy our conversations. Well, you helped bring me into a different world. Uh, you brought me into this music industry, uh, and we'll get to that discovery. But what I, what I we're trying to do with this podcast is speak to people that have lived it, who have been at the highest level and achieved some great success and to bring these stories and moments to the new generation. I feel like I'm a music lover, but also a father who loves to bring to the next generation uh, information, encouragement. And it, so that's the purpose, I think, behind this podcast. So I like to give people kind of a, a look into your journey and what brought you to this point. Uh, so I would love to go back because you actually came from a home that had music and actually you grew up around one of the biggest stars in the world, but especially in the UK and your mother was a manager. Yeah. My mother was the first female manager in England um, back in the sixties, in the late sixties. And she discovered this 14 year old artist called Lulu who um, became a very big artist in the, in the UK in the middle of the Beatles and all that pop explosion that happened in the sixties. Um, and, uh, she also married the songwriter who wrote the songs, a lot of the songs for Lulu. Um, Lulu had a number one in America called to sir with love from a movie, which my uh, stepfather wrote. And, uh, yeah, I definitely grew up from the age of four immersed in the business. Um, and definitely, you know, immersed in developing young artists because uh, Lulu was 14 and she lived with us initially and then she lived with her grandmother and, and my grandmother until she um, married one of the Bee Gees. But um, definitely grew up with uh, management and uh, artists all around the whole time. Wow, that's um, I didn't know she married one of the Bee Gees. She married Morris when she was 21. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, to serve with love was James Bond. No, that was the to serve with love was the Sidney Poitier movie. Oh, that's right, that's right. Endearing movie about a school in uh, in the East End of London, um, and with with, you know, with one of the first, you know, with a black teacher, and it was the, one of the first films that dealt with that uh, back in the sixties. And and to serve with love was the name of the movie. Uh, and also the name of the song, which became a number one here in America. Oh, that's fantastic. And your mother was a female manager during yeah. this time. And you were able to watch that. Yeah, no, she managed Lulu for 26 years. So she managed Lulu from when I was four years old till, you know, when I was 30. So it was very much, uh, and she worked from home. So it was a huge part of our lives. Wow. Um, when to sew with love was filmed, I was six years old and um, I'd had appendicitis and I was stuck at home recovering. And I went to the, to the studio, to the film studios, Pinewood every day and just watched them film that, uh, that movie. And uh, when the song um, became a hit in America, you know, cause my mother worked from home, I was the little kid answering the phone and getting all the chart positions <laughs> and, and what, you know, grow up the billboard chart. And I remember I subscribed to billboard when I was seven. <laughs> I got that my is amazing. And, um, I was, you know, completely obsessed with the projection, you know, up the charts of the song. And, you know, Lulu was the singer and my mother was the manager and my stepfather had written the song. And it was, uh, 
it was an amazing, you know, birth into the business, really. And I think from then on, despite having an education that took me in a different direction, I think I was probably always destined to come back into this business. <laughs> Which happened now? You, you pursued your education, but you ultimately ended up in management yourself. Yeah, I had a very strange education because I was only educated in a French school for reasons that I really can't explain. <laughs> but I was educated entirely in French um, in, at, a, at a school called the Lycée in London. And I, um, I went to Cambridge uh, from, from that school to do law. And in Britain, you do law as an undergraduate. Uh, as you don't have to be a graduate to do law. So I did law as an undergraduate and got my master's in law, but then realized I just totally did not want to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and uh, met a band who I just completely fell in love with. And um, that was the beginning of my management career. Not, uh, just a, not just a band, but an international sensation. I don't, I don't know if they're called Wang Chung. I'm not sure <laughs> they were really a sensation, but they... You know, their name has lived on because of a song called Everybody Have Fun Tonight, which became you know, something of a classic and also something of a joke. You know, you hear, you hear them mentioned in Saturday Night Live and all kinds of movies. Um, so you know, their name has lived on and they're still, you know, very, very good friends of mine. But yes, that was my, um, my beginning in management, you know, starting from nothing with, um, with this band and um, signing them. I was one of the first young managers to sign my band directly to the US from you know, living in the UK. And uh, the band were British. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously I was living in England at that time. But uh, I had the dream of getting them signed in America, especially as no one in England wanted them. <laughs> <laughs> I was 22 years old. I went to every single record label in England and everyone turned them down. And the minute I set foot in LA, basically every single label wanted them. And uh, it was a very different situation. So it definitely was the birth of my love affair with America. Oh, yeah. But well, yeah. most people encourage you, especially if you're from outside the US, bloom where you're planted, build a story, then come to the biggest market. It's kind of strange that you would bring them here and have every record label open. No, it was an extraordinary experience. Um, they had a song, the band Wang Chung, they had a song called Dance Hall Days. Um, and the beautiful thing about this is that when I started managing them, my first band, I'm 22 years old, I'm just starting, and they're signed to a label called Arista. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Arista were definitely not giving them the love they deserved. So I got them out of Arista. Oh, that's funny. Um, and I had, um, as, a, as a young, when I was 10 or 11, the first album I bought was by a, an artist called Laura Nero, who's an American songwriter. And I was fascinated by her. And a guy called David Geffen was her manager and her publisher. And I'd been following his career. And I had this, my heart set on being part of his new label. He had started Geffen Records. And I wanted Wang Chung to be the first baby artist on Geffen Records. Um, and so we had many offers, but we did end up magically um, with Geffen. And they did an incredible job and, you know, gave the band hits out of the box and, you know, really completely began my career in America. That's it, incredible. It was an extraordinary experience with David Geffen because, you know, Geffen at that time was a new label. They, they, they had um, seven people working there. And, but they had this roster of established artists that David was able to sign, like Elton John and Donna Summer and bands like Asia and Quarterflash. And um, they were, they, they set up a roster of established artists with no baby artists. So um, we were the first baby artists and he took me under his wing. Um, and they were so incredible to me, you know, thinking, I mean, considering that I was a 22-year-old guy from England who'd never managed before, it was just unbelievable the support they gave me. And that was a nine-year experience for me. And I, 
always take that with me mm. when I'm dealing with my young managers because the way that I was treated by them was so incredible and the way that they taught me and they, there was never a moment of, hey, we should get a big American manager or any moment of you know, questioning my role. It was quite the reverse. Um, and now I take that with me every single day because when I, there are so many young managers now and for me, it's a joy because I get to do that with them. Well, it's, and it's, not it's, just the young managers, but people like myself that were young in managing, but I wasn't young. You were pretty young. <laughs> <laughs> you were pretty damn young. And, but no, you weren't, you weren't 22, but you were, yeah, you were a brand new manager. You yeah, know, and, and I had music experience, but you didn't just welcome me. Uh, you, were, you were respectful. You were educating me. You gave me a lane. So I absolutely agree. You carried that with you, and you gave it back to people like me. Good. Well, I'm happy to hear that. And I, you know, certain key relationships, you know, over the last years, um, like for example, you know, Andrew Gertler, who manages Sean Mendes and, and uh, many others, you know, who I'm dealing with now, you know, who, are, who started with this project, you know, it's been so great for me to uh, be able to support them and, you know, help nurture them, but also, it's a great pleasure for me to work with managers like you um, and, and, and other managers who just really believe in their artists and who have that commitment and passion. For me, that's really all I need. You know, like if I've got a partner in management who has that dedication and that vision for the artist and that commitment, it's everything. You know, and that's exactly what happened with you, you know, when I met your 10 year old son and um, fell in love with him. It thought, <laughs> prodigy and a brilliant brilliant person and he still is and um you know you were completely focused and dedicated um on 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 your on your on your sons all of them and uh i knew there was no stopping you no yeah, no very I... there was no stopping i mean you 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 had to um surrender a very important other career for that which you did with great courage and uh, I'll never forget that ever. And uh, look what it led to. So that's a living example of what we're talking about. So somehow you made it from management into the actual record and recording side of the business. How did that transition take place? It, it's a very interesting thing what happened. Um, I had been a manager from like the age of 22 until like 30 and uh, managed several, several people. Um, I also managed this girl called Saida Garrett, who was incredible, who wrote Man in the Mirror for Michael Jackson. And I had, a, had an amazing like group of artists and many of them, you know, wrote their songs in my house. Um, but I got married at the end of my twenties and had kids quickly and started to feel that the, my lifestyle as a manager, because I was so close to the artists, we were all friends, that, that it didn't co collide as well with my lifestyle as a married man with two young children. And um, I had had offers from labels, and then it was just one of those things that Michelle Anthony, who worked at Sony, um, had started, had taken over Sony with Tommy Mottola, in the uh, in 1990 and then in 1991 um two of my bands had split up and i was in new york and so many labels just suggested why don't you come over you know and and and, and move into the and you've always done your own a and you know maybe you should think about doing that now and michelle anthony was completely instrumental in in, in having the idea of moving me and the family um, from London to New York to become the VP of a and at Epic in New York. Um, and Tommy Matola was very supportive. And I just thought, I need to try this. Like, I need to go into the heart of the business, which in those days was definitely New York as well as mm -hmm. LA, definitely New York as well. And Sony at that time was, you know, Michael Jackson. And I mean, just 
the biggest artists and uh, it still is. But at that time, it was this monolithic, you know, center of the universe company that I just very much thought I could learn a massive amount from. So I'm 30 years old. I haven't really worked for a company before. And I decided to give it a shot. I think to myself, I'll do it for a year. We'll see if it works. The kids are really young. That they're two and three months. At one's two, one's three months old. It won't affect them. Let's you know. Let's jump in. You know, Sony were magnificent about the way they, you know, handled us moving over and took incredible care of us. And uh, I jumped in. Wow. And Michelle yeah. Anthony, I mean, is still a giant in the industry today. Yeah, and 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 a giant to me. I mean, I I work with her very, very closely in the last years before I joined Arista. Um, so, you know, our relationship has spanned uh, 30 years and, uh, and it has been, she's been most, probably the most important person in my career in many ways um, and just been an incredible supporter and friend. So that's how the transition happened. And the first year was difficult. You know, the first year was you know, learning to work in the company. And that's another thing that I've, you know, got a very big takeaway with when I develop executives, because uh, if you come into a corporation at 30 and you've done it before, it is, it is quite an experience. The rules, the permissions, the, you know, the, the, the sometimes the hierarchy, um, and it can be daunting um, if you're not used to it. And it's something that I watch out for very carefully with my young executives. And I'm very careful to really mentor them through it so it feels great to them um but, but you mentioned that it was difficult the first year was it the corporate side because obviously too there's politics there are priorities at high high levels what was the most difficult part of that first year for you adjusting to you know having to go to having to do things that, mm -hmm. that, <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that I wasn't in control of, many things that, that, that I needed to attend. Um, having a boss was incredibly hard for me, even though I loved him. He was a great guy, but I, I found that impossibly difficult. Um, and it was always something I never wanted to do anyway. So that was the hard to adjust to. And then wanting to find great records, you know, and, and being super ambitious. And in the first year, you know, I, my first time living in New York, um, building the relationships so that I could have success, you know, which actually, and my, my first success ended up happening with a, a UK artist. Um, and it did take me about 18 months. Wow. And what was that artist? That was Desri with a song yeah. called, yeah. Yeah. Wow. It was, a, it was Desri was the first, was the first breakthrough for me. And, uh, and that was, that was a great experience. Um, and, and, and it was a platinum album and, uh, that, that, that got me started and got me my confidence because when you do A and R, you know, you've got to get your confidence and, mm -hmm. um, people can help you with that. And then you need to have some kind of success to sort of confirm it. So, um, I was very grateful. There's a song called you, you know, you gotta be and the you gotta be. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. amazing. And the, lyric, yeah, the, min, the minute you mention her name, the song is running in my head. Yeah. Well, because the lyric's so relevant. You know, you've got to be stronger. You've got to be wiser. You know, so it was an inspiring song for me and for everyone. And uh, we really Absolutely. stuck with that song. And, and, then, um, and then, then it was Oasis that really, that really, really, I think, propelled me into feeling that, you know, that, I, could, that I could do something important you know, it, within the framework of a company. Yeah. A legendary band and impact was international. How did you find them? What was the journey to coming up with Oasis? I can really take very little credit for it in a way because Alan McGee, who was this incredible A&R visionary in England, a Scottish guy who ran Creation Records, which was definitely the coolest indie um, uh, in England. He, he, had, he, he happened to be in my office 
Um, I mean, these things are so fortuitous and sometimes it's really blessed if you just have time. Right. And I was with Alan McGee and I really like him and he's playing me all different music and I'm loving just spending time with him and listening to his music. None of it was right for America, I felt, but it, mm -hmm. but it was all great stuff. And then at the end, he said, you know, I was in Manchester a couple of nights ago and this band sort of stormed the stage uninvited and performed. And I just think they're really interesting. Can I play you their first demo? And it was a song called Columbia. And I don't know what happened in that moment, but I can honestly tell you, I've never loved a first demo more than that song, Columbia. And it was almost semi-instrumental, but there was something in that demo that was just so inspiring to me. Um, and I just, I don't know, fell in love with the sound immediately, like literally immediately, which is definitely a pattern with me, by the way, in terms of the more immediate. Um, right. So, so I went, uh, Richard Griffiths, who was my boss and me, were in London and we managed to, we saw them at a venue where there were th at the most 20 people. And uh, we were able to sign them for the world outside of America. And then, you know, Alan McGee, you know, had them on creation in England. And so we were able to have um, this incredible global relationship with the band, which, um, which, has, you know, which I then went on to be involved with them for all the seven albums they did at Sony. So that was um, an incredible experience for me on so many levels because they were quite a handful, but um, <laughs> just so brilliant, you know, musically. And I just really enjoyed working with them so much. And uh, that was really, I think, a very important turning point for me, you know, with that, with, 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 with Oasis. And it was all about Alan McGee. He, you know, he discovered the band. I just got the opportunity sitting in New York to hear them early and get involved. Well, and you had to have the antennas, the feeling, that natural connection to them that marks your life with so many artists that allows them to come into a bigger opportunity. Uh, Alan McGee obviously has his uh, success uh, and incredible track record, but you brought them to Sony, which brought them to the world. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a great great collaboration and you know again their manager who marcus russell who to this day a bit like you kevin is a dear dear friend i mean he was just magic to work with he'd actually been a school teacher um in his past life and he was just an amazing human and he still manages Noel gallagher to this day and wow. um, he um he was incredible incredible partner to me in the global strategy because he, unlike a lot of British bands in those days, he saw it as a global thing from the very beginning, which was not the case back in the 90s with what they called Britpop. Mm -hmm. Most of the artists that were Britpop, which was really a phenomenon that was begun entirely by Oasis, but they all thought about the UK and the NME and the different, the different sort of cultural activities in the UK. They did not think globally, most of them. But Marcus Russell had that vision from the beginning um, and therefore spent a lot of time, you know, with me in America and also in Europe and, uh, and, in, and in Asia. And so they did become, you know, for a while, a genuine global phenomenon. And their second album, you know, What's the Story, Morning Glory, did 17 million albums. You know, and it, 17 and, uh, million yeah. albums. That's yeah, insane. Album, a lot more. That was last time I looked, which was like 10 years ago. So it's wow. probably a lot more now. But, you know, they, they, they were a British band, you know, from Manchester who really did um, have a global impact, you know, and, uh, and they really deserved it. So uh, that was very incredibly instrumental in, I think, you know, how my career developed. Um, you know, we were in Peru and, you know, my sons were big throughout the world, but in Latin and South America, it was stadiums. In Peru, they broke the record held by Oasis for the largest gathering of people by a Caucasian group. <laughs> 
So it was two groups that you were connected to that well, set, set the uh, record in Peru for the largest audience. Okay, well, that's good to hear. But, you know, the, the other interesting connection, of course, is, you know, I do seem to get on with brothers, whether it's the Jonas Brothers or the Gallagher Brothers or the Madden Twins from um, Good Charlotte, you know. Oh, so I definitely got a pattern, I've definitely got a pattern with brothers. Um, maybe it's because I'm, I'm an identical twin myself. I don't know. But, um, yes, that's, that's great to hear. So you were working, were you working – under one of the labels or were you working directly with the Sony umbrella as far as A&R? So in those first five years at Sony, um, I was A&R and initially VP of A&R and then I moved into A&R but also with an international marketing um, involvement too. Um, and, And then I moved when I met you, um, I had finally persuaded Sony after two years to give me my own label, which was called Daylight. And you were... I think that's maybe- where we met you. And that's why I was asking. At first, then you started specifically A&R, but with Daylight, it, it was eclectic, but it was amazing. Every artist you had seemed on the top of their game. I mean, it was a tiny, it was a small label, but basically after you know, moving to the senior VP level at A&R um, at Epic, I really, and then I became the general manager of Epic. I really did want my own label. I was like desperate for it. Um, and um, I, I just knew that I needed to have something that I could call my own in a sense. And uh, eventually Michelle agreed to give me um, a label, which was unusual in those days for executives to be allowed to do that. And the label was called Daylight because it was the end of the, it was the light at the end of the tunnel <laughs> and, um, and uh nick jonas was one of the first artists signed and obviously good charlotte um and and, and we had some i mean obviously cindy law but there were some great very special um artists on on daylight if i remember correctly you had phantom planet yeah and delta goodrum yeah which uh the world may not know but we didn't allow the boys when they were young to have pinups. Uh, and you gave the boys a Delta Goodrum calendar. And it was the only calendar we had that the boys could have up on the wall of a beautiful young lady. <laughs> well, plus, you know, she was such a wholesome, she is such an amazingly wholesome young lady. You know, a calendar by Delta is a different thing, right? Yeah, it wasn't pinup for sure. But... It, that was their first like calendar of a beautiful woman on the wall. Uh, and she was inspiring for my kids. Um, her song born to try. I remember walking in the Sony building. Uh, and for the backstory, there was a man named Bob Bolin who introduced us, but Bob found out that there was interest from potential interest from another label. And he said, before you do that, there's a wonderful A&R guy, record label head within Sony that's a great person that I want to introduce you to for Nick. And that's when we met in Bob's office. I and, know. Uh, walked I w- in with Nick. Nick hadn't yet turned 11, I don't think. No, we had just fin- he had just finished – his he had just done Les Mis, so he was 10 years old, and we had the Christmas song that had uh, started to gain a little attention, very little, but uh, it caught Bob's attention, and he and I kind of formed a friendship, and before we would go somewhere else, we had to meet David Massey. I'm very thankful to this day for that meeting. And so am I, because, you know, I responded immediately. That's another immediate response thing, you know, that, 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 that I've had in my life, you know, where you meet a person and you just know that the person is special, let alone the talent. And Nick, you know, he was, he is, he was exactly as he is now. I mean, he, <laughs> at, at 10, he was a little man. And That's he right. Was, he was serious and he was 
massively talented and confident. Was, yeah, confident and he had a vision. And he could, he was even at the beginning of writing songs. I mean, it was extraordinary how talented he was. So there was no hesitation about, about grabbing the opportunity. I was delighted to be able to get into business with you. <laughs> we were having success with a girl called Anastasia who had um, done so well in Europe and we, you know, good Charlotte. And there was a lot of things happening in our little label and it was a, it was a, but it was a small label. So we really had time to really devote. So um, it was great to add Nick. And then of course, you know, you brought in the brothers. So. <laughs> well, a- you know, it was amazing. Uh, we, they were inspired by watching Nick in this opportunity. And, you know, I, I had started when Nick would go back and forth to his Broadway shows, he would say, let's write a song. So we would, and, and I had been writing for a while. So I would write with him on the way there and we would refine it on the way home. And that was our pattern. And that led to your office and Nick started meeting with these people. But the brothers then said, well, we want to write with you. And I walked in one night and they were standing in a triangle facing each other and they were singing, please be mine. And that was the next morning I called you and I said, David, I know we have a meeting with Nick, but something happened last night with his brothers and Nick and you need, you need to hear this. But my memory of it is that you, you framed it much more as a social thing. You, you, <laughs> You, you, I think you, your thing was much more, you sh- the brothers want to know you and you should know the brothers. I was like, I'd love to meet the brothers. You know, let's, let's meet. <laughs> so for me, for me, it was, it was legitimately um, a social meeting. It was just the idea of being able to meet the family, which I was totally into. Which, actually, which was true. I never would have assumed you, no, you would didn't. have, would have felt or seen what you felt in that room. No, you didn't. You didn't give me any impression that that was that it was that kind of meeting, and that is probably why it was so brilliant because <laughs> it wasn't that kind of meeting until they said, "Oh, we wrote this song last night. Can we just sing it for you?" And it was it was the three of them in the triangle singing, "Please be mine." I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> oh my god!" I mean, look at them. I mean, this is like a complete no brainer. This is. The Jonas Brothers, you know, and, and I was like, do you think we could maybe <laughs> sign the other two? Like, would you mind? Because yeah, Nick was already signed to us and we had done, we'd already done Dear God. Like, That's we, right. We had a song, Dear God, that was so beautiful. It was Nicholas Jonas, you know, th- th- this, you know, this artist with a, you know, spiritual side to him. And it, that was already going. So, so meeting the brothers was an unexpected, completely unexpected bonus and, and the initial the initial idea was me sort of sheepishly asking you can i can we <laughs> sign the brothers as well and maybe do some songs with all of them together like a jonas brothers thing but it was never the initial intent that it would be what it became no it, for it wasn't that way for us either it was something happened and you're you're part of this so you should hear it i mean i don't think i left the room before you said do you think we could option the boys <laughs> well, and, 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 and it's just, it's just, I think for people listening, you know, it's just so interesting that in our business, you know, you've got to follow those instincts and feelings that you have, you know, because they, magic can come from those things, you know, and, 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 and uh, if you don't, you can miss out on something that has the most extraordinary game-changing trajectory, which definitely was the case with this, which was also, you know, I've had that experience with, you know, with uh, some others. This isn't an everyday thing. It's an extraordinary thing and it happens maybe, it may be every year or two, but when it happens, you've got, to, you've got to follow that to the ends of the earth because it can be the mm-hmm. joke. Or a Sean Mendez. You know, you had no. mentioned before just a quality, a thread that you see. I would love for you to describe as you look at artists, because you have, your track record stands for itself, David. You, you have worked with some of the premier talent in the world. No question about it. 
Thanks. That can you describe that? I know it's intangible, right? It, it, it is a it is a feeling. It's but but there's something in the people that must make it. Absolutely. Um, I, for me, there's been you're right a consistent thread um, that I have seen. When I meet an artist, I don't sell. I only want to hear them. I want to listen to their dreams, their vision, wh- where they, what their aspirations are. And I learn from what they tell me and from what they exude, what their driving desire is and what their capacity is. So there's a glow that comes Mm -hmm. out of people, I think, who have something truly special within them. And it's in, it's in the boys, obviously. Um, I saw in Nick immediately. Um, I saw in Sean immediately, definitely saw in Liam and Noel Gallagher immediately, Shakira. um, There there, there are many examples, Um, but not as many as I would wish. I wish there were examples like that all the time, but you know, stars are rare, but they are, they have first and foremost, the ability and the talent. Mm -hmm. But they also have a legitimate natural charisma. They have drive and they have this innate desire that means that nothing will stop them. And that really does seem to be a pattern that separates the good from the great. Um, And the list of people that you just described have that drive. There's no question. I mean, not that I was um, involved with Kanye West at the beginning, but when I met Kanye West, when I worked for Island Def Jam, um, when he was doing the graduation album, it was so clear with him what was going on. He had that going on as well, you know, in spades as well. Mm. And, you know, there's, there's, there are examples obviously of artists that, that are not artists that I've signed, but where you see that, um, and it's, it, it, it's, it's very powerful. You just have to have your antenna up and be open to seeing and hearing what they're saying. And then you start to get a feeling of, um, you know, that desire, that driving desire for greatness. It's, it's, that's the difference. It's they want to be great. They don't want to be good. They mm. want more than anything to drive to greatness. And I think that is a very, a very separating factor for the ones that really go that much further and, and have proper careers. You know, when you signed Nick, there, there's, there are memories that come to mind. When you signed Nick and he started working on that first Nicholas Jonas record, we would come to Sony either to the studio publishing part or the offices where writing was taking place at 550 Madison Avenue. And they would, he would go in with these top songwriters or songwriter teams. And he's 10, now 11 years old. And they would say, Nick, and usually I was close by, Nick, you, you just sit right there. I'm going to start working on some things, and you just let me know if you have any preferences or thoughts. Like clockwork, about five minutes into it, he would walk outside with me and say, they're treating me like a child. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Nick, be patient, wait 30 minutes, and then show them what you can do. And he would sit there looking at his watch and looking at the clock and like clockwork at that half hour, he would go, I have an idea. And he would either pick up the guitar, go to the keyboard and blow their minds. But that, that thing in him, even that young of they're treating me like a child and I have a purpose. There's no question that was a part of Nick's life. And it's very interesting. You raised that because once you commit to someone like, like Nick or, you know, Sean, who was 15, there is no treating them like a child because no. they already have enough 
gravitas within them that you don't need to. It, it's really about tapping into their, their intelligence and their talent and um, being sensitive to their age for lots of reasons, including not tiring them out and understanding that they're not grown ups physically. But um, whether it was Nick or someone like Sean, you know, I, ne I never really ever thought of them as, 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 as kids. And um, certainly with Sean and, and Andrew, um, who was his young manager, you know, I mean, we made really all the decisions together, you know, and, and um, Sean was so integral into everything that we did, you know, and, and he, he understood Instagram and Vine and he understood, he taught me stuff. And I, you know, the, and he brought me into a more modern world than I had even been in. That I, that I might not have known as much about if I hadn't been as involved with working with Sean as a partner. Mm. You know, and I, think, I think that is the case more than ever now. I mean, you know, there's, we're now seeing managers who are really genuinely capable, who are making mega deals, who are 19 years old. It's unbelievable. The new Generation Z is another generation because they grew up you know, with technology completely. And they grew up with, you know, with everything to do with Spotify and to do with social media. And they, their brains are, are wired differently. That's and, amazing. Uh, yeah. And it's, I find that it's great to be able to, to, to learn from them and to collaborate with them and make sure that, you know, from what I do, my label, Arista, you know, is, you know, as modern as it possibly can be. That was the whole point, you know. Uh, of, of starting, restarting Arista was to have a label that reflected, you know, the modern times as, as up to date and as nimble as possible. Well, and you're already seeing breakthrough success in streaming. Mm. We are, we are definitely beginning to really see it now. Yeah. And, uh, and the team at Arista and the ideas that they have in terms of digital marketing and TikTok and all the different platforms that you need to develop a new artist today, um, you know, we are deeply in touch with. So it feels like we're in a position to do what I love doing best, which is develop artists. That's amazing. Well, speaking of development, uh, our paths unfortunately had to uh, deviate from each other for a period. Uh, the boys ended up at Disney and the partnership was productive with product you developed. Uh, in fact, we left with product that you recommended we do year 3000. <laughs> and a month after we left, the boys exploded with that content. But as life often does, it, it came back around. Uh, the boys broke up and you and Nick reconnected and started another journey uh, that was incredibly special. Uh, what did it feel like with Nick when he came back now as a man, the brothers broke up, and now there's an opportunity to work with Nick as a solo artist? Again, that was thanks to you because um, you definitely tipped me off that um, the boys you know, were separating. And obviously... You know, my relationship with the boys began with Nick and I knew exactly and better than anyone apart from you and the, and the brothers what he was capable of. I knew what he was capable of. So the more, I think the morning after the band separated, I grabbed breakfast with Nick and I'd always been in touch with Nick because he'd been writing songs and, you know, so... There hadn't been a break in our relationship, you know, per se. So I had breakfast with Nick and he had his, he had a buzz cut and he just looked like a total star, you know, and, and then in the evening we sort of listened to music together and played demos. And, you know, I just had, I just had to, I mean, we, well, no, at breakfast, I mean, we, we decided to do it again. I mean, we had breakfast and I, and I committed there and then. To, um, to, to, to going again. Uh, there was no doubt in my mind, none whatsoever. And then in the evening we talked about music and we started to 
fantasize about the direction that Nick Jonas would be taking as a solo artist. And I knew, you know, from the start that he had this incredible soul in his voice. And, and obviously I knew about his songwriting skills and um, it, it was magic right away. I mean, it was the way that it um, developed from there was extraordinary. Like Eric Wong, who was our general manager, Ireland, who's a um, very creative executive. I um, love Eric. Good yeah. man. He got these photos taken with Nick that he just, Nick just looked like a complete star. Um, and that defined his image. And that happened immediately. Then, you know, Chains and Jealous came and these songs came so fast. And there was really no stopping us, you know, and um, it, 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 it was the most natural thing in the world. I mean, amazing to work with Nick in that capacity because I believe in him so much. But um, the music and the fact that we had a number one right away with Jealous and then you know what I love. You know what I love about Jealous too is there were so many voices saying, you know, the Jonas Brothers needed hits. The Jonas Brothers needed hits, and he wrote along with his brothers the content of the Jonas Brothers. Um, that it was a song he wrote that was soulful, that broke. Yeah, and 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 got him to number one at radio, which first which, time. All, all, all the breakthroughs happened. You know, I mean, Jonas Brothers had been enormous, but what they hadn't yet had was that sort of number one radio song. Never cracked the top 10. And then, and then with, and then with the, the first single of Nick, it just was, it was incredible. And, and he was also to see Nick so happy. I think it was a very, plus so many things happened for him. I mean, he discovered that he really was an actor. And he did, he did that t a TV series where he really, he, you know, there were so many avenues of his talent that he explored. And, you know, he, he, you know, he, he was an, an extraordinary multi-talented young man. And yeah. um, I always say that Nick Jonas could easily be president of the United States. <laughs> he always, well, he's got all the qualities. There's no stopping him. He can do, he can do whatever he wants because he's, yeah. um, he's, 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 Always he's, he's a rare combination to be that driven and yet that in tune with others. It, it, it really is rare. And I have never seen him not be completely gracious. It is unbelievable. The amount of times that I have been in restaurants with Nick Jonas, having lunch with him or dinner with him, talking deeply about stuff, and people walk up to the table all the time, you know, even at the most fancy restaurants, these people will just walk up to Nick right while we're talking and he sees me getting irritable and he knows me and knows that I get really offended by people just interrupting us. And every time he is the most perfect gentleman and oh. gracious and I'm sitting there getting irritated. It's not even me they're trying to talk to, <laughs> but, but Nick, I just, he is always composed. It's and always sort of immaculate. It's uh, there, there's really nothing he can't do. Mm. He's very exceptional in that way because he is an artist and he is a creative, but he's also could run, run a business or a country. You know, he's just got that kind of, uh, that kind That's of wonderful. intelligence, I feel. Yeah. Well, let me, let me ask you a question that has, often cross my mind with you because you've had so many successes. Has there been an artist that you really wanted to sign that got away that you weren't able to sign, but you knew they would be great? Um, yeah, sure though. I mean, I need to think about that. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is actually an artist that I did sign, <laughs> that, that, um, that who I thought would be huge, a girl called Lara Fabian, and she didn't become huge. But I mm -hmm. thought she was, um, back in the day, you know, the next Barbara Streisand kind of thing. And um, that's the one that got away that I did sign. 
because no, she, and, I, and I understand that because I've had that too, where my antennas go up and there's, there's a lack of connection or the pieces didn't come together. That's a painful thing when you know that there's something there. Um, you know, she, she's so extraordinary as a singer. I, you know, for whatever reason, I, I, I know, I actually know why it didn't work. I mean, she did, she sold a million albums. She did, she didn't fail by any means, but, um, but she, the reason that she didn't go all the way was because she ke- came up at the same time as Celine Dion mm. and uh, people compared them. So there wasn't going to be two. So that, I think that that's the reason Lara didn't become as big as she should have, but she, she was massively successful in France. I mean, she was, probably the biggest in France. There's not, she didn't fail by any means, but I thought she could be a global superstar. But I think the fact that Celine did it meant that it was hard for her to as well. Um, but when you asked me the other question, um, it's interesting because it's hard for me to answer because if I want an artist that much, um, I tend to go to the ends of the earth to work with them. Um, and you do usually end up working with them. I, I can't think offhand of one that I didn't sign. That's I amazing. Can of, I can think of people now who are not yet big, like Pink Sweats, who I just love and wished I could have signed. I just, he just didn't, he didn't choose our stuff. We were a baby label. And uh, when we met him, um, the label was not even four months old. Um, but I really wanted to sign him, but I unfortunately didn't get him, which I understand because we were still not even a formed label. But um, I think he could be a big, a big artist one day, and I, I love him. But um, I, I haven't had um, a lot of experience that I can think of of that. I, I will need to think about that and come back to you on that. Question. No, no, no. I, I think the answer says so much about you uh, that you chase them to the ends of the earth to get them. And that's, that's kind of, you know, I count you as a friend, but I've also seen your commitment to Nick that lasted through signing him, it becoming the brothers, the brothers ending up somewhere else, and you never left the relationship. Uh, that, that piece of you is real. Yeah. I mean, it's a lifelong thing for me. What, if I commit... <clears throat> To an artist, for me, it's a for, it's a forever thing, because because mm. you know, I'll go to the ends of the earth to sign them, but then I'll also go to the ends of the earth to break them. So it becomes. Um, I mean, I feel that way about you know the artists on Arista now. I mean, working with a kid called J.P. Sachs, who I just believe in so much, you know, and I'll um, I have that same connection and feeling that feels you know like a forever thing. You know, I hope that um, I always know him and I always will be able to <clears throat> help him and develop, help, help him get to his goals. It's, it's just, it's the reason, Kevin, why I am better off wanting a slightly smaller major label because I do like to get involved and I do like to, you know, really believe and get my hands dirty and pay attention to detail so I have come to terms with the fact that I am suited to a more personal label environment. Because the, you give your heart as well. Yeah, I do. I do. And, 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 and I don't know how to do it the other way. And therefore, I don't really feel the need to have 300 artists or 200 artists or 100 artists. I, I, I feel the need to do an amazing job with the artists that we have. Mm. Rather, than, rather than size and quantity, I am more about focus. That's my, that's my, my, my desire. You know, and and, and I'm, I'm an artist guy. You know, I'm completely driven by the artists themselves and, and their management, but that's what comes first for me. So it's kind of personal in that way. And right. uh, I do a better job like that because I notice details that others wouldn't and I and I care so and for end, other for other record company guys you can see right through it if they say oh yeah I stick with an artist but they don't it's not in them 
David, you, we've had artists, we've had success together, and you've called me to drop an artist that was an expected call. I don't know many people that would make that call personally, but also leave me, and of course me leave you with, we're friends forever. I expected this call. We haven't, you know, seen this one break through. Um, the, the, a lasting friendship and commitment to each other that's greater than the individual projects. That's a rare thing that you carry with you that uh, I think marks the greatest music executives that have ever existed. You know, um, thank you for that. I mean, David Geffen taught me about transparency in a way. And um, he was, he liked to just keep it, you know, open and honest because when you're dealing with really bright people, they tend to understand, right. you know, if, if you talk honestly about the situation you're in and what you're faced with and why a certain situation can't happen, I find that the really, all the good managers and the good, the good executives, they, they will empathize with something that's coming directly from the heart that's, and that's just a, the truth about a situation. I don't really, I'm a straight shooter. I don't really, I don't like to play games. It doesn't work for me at all. So I find that um, if you're dealing with the right people, um, there's an understanding that develops. And I think you have to trust that you can be like that. And well, and I often will say, we're all adults on the phone. Like, give me the real story because not everybody is, finds it comfortable. I'll ask the hard question. Is the song dead? Like, uh, you know, do we need an, is it time for like CPR or is this dead and no recovery? I know sometimes it shocks people given that I am a heart guy myself, that I can be that blunt, but it's the only way I know how to be. It's, it, it's, it comes and it goes, but if you're committed to my artist over the long term and you're committed to me over the long term, we're going to be fine. But that's rare to find people that, in this business who are genuinely um, of that make. But the, the, the reason I think you're like that as well is because that's who you are as a, as a person and where you come from as a person, but also, you know, you want what's best for your artists. So in that sense, people don't understand that the, the interests of the artist and the label are much more aligned than people think. So you understand that, it's not great for your artist if a song is no longer functioning to, to push it because that's to the detriment of, an, of the artist. Right. Because you don't want to push a song that is no longer alive. You want to move to the next song. So you you're, can you're wasting money and you're burning out your relationships, especially at radio and streaming. It's not worth it. So, so, you, you, so you understand that and you've got the best interest of your artist at heart. So you're able to take that reality. Because you, you, because you understand the bigger picture, which is the career trajectory of the artist. So we, we all have to make, you know, those those tough decisions. But the, for me, the secret is really in the triangular relationship. You know, I always feel, and this has been something that's happened to me with every su su successful project that I've been able to work on, is that it's always been defined by the relationship between me and the manager and the artist as a triangle of decision-making. Um, because if you make those decisions together, you're probably going to be making the right decisions because everyone's interest is, is aligned. And um, you're factoring in all of it. And the artist is part of it. And understand. So good. So I, I, I mean, whether it's you and the Jonas Brothers or Marcus Russell and Oasis or CC Kurzman, with Shakira, I mean, Ed, or Andrew Gertlow and Sean, I mean, the examples are, are endless, but in every case, that has been the fundamental dynamic um, in terms of all those hard decisions and all the great decisions. That you, go, you go into the journey together as a team, and therefore the decisions are pure. And yeah. I find that has been, uh, for me, a cornerstone of the right way of uh, developing a career. That's amazing. Well, and I can truly, as a friend and a person that's lived some life with you, 
I can vouch for the fact that that's the way you live your life. Uh, I've never once, with multiple artists, never once felt belittled, put down, uh, manipulated uh, by my friend, David Massey. Uh, truly special. I would hope not, I would hope not Kevin. <laughs> no, it's honest. It's honest, but it, it, it is first and foremost relationship and belief in my kids. Yeah. Uh, and that's, that's special. As we close, what advice? There's a David Massey that's 22 years old out there, but the next generation. And if you could, whether it's London or in my case, I think of Belmont, North Carolina, a mill village where I grew up, or Casa Grande, Arizona, where I started writing songs as I was doing flooring in the summer heat. But there was a, there was a Kevin Jonas. There was a budding songwriter and manager, musician. For that 22-year-old out there that has it in them, but looks ahead and they don't know how they're going to get there, what advice would you give them for this part of their journey? Well, if the, if the question relates to a manager or an artist, which is what you're saying. Yes. You have to be in touch with that desire and then be a self-starter. You have to make things happen yourself things will not just come to you. you 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 have to use every tool at your disposal especially in this world order um to self-start and create turn your dreams into reality so there's a perfect example right now there's a young artist called kurt now there's an example of someone that i would have loved to sign and didn't <laughs> curtis waters is a young man 20 year old from north carolina who's about to have a huge hit with a song called Stunning. And I think he's very, a very special young man. And he, you know, has created this on his own. You know, the, the initial dynamic, he made an album in, the, in his bedroom alone. He's created this hit. Uh, he made a video by himself in lockdown that is, is now uh, set to explode. And, you know, he's a total self-starter. And um, he's a you know, kind of a living example. And there's... Um, they're, they're actually, North Carolina is definitely the center of gravity for me right now, Kevin, because I'm, I'm about to sign two artists from there right now. Um, so in all, in all those cases for the young generation, it's that whether it's a manager or an artist, you see that spark of, I'm going to make this happen. If, you know, if I'm, if I'm 15 year old Sean Mendes in my bedroom, I'm just going to make these Vine videos until someone notices me and then I'm going to do more of them and then I'm going to learn how to play the guitar on YouTube and then I'm going to go and see that guy in New York and play in Wonderwall because I know he signed Oasis you know and <laughs> that's 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 Sean you know and, and 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 you've got to turn that dream into reality so that is about making things happen and I really believe that with you know desire and, you know, obviously talent, you can do that, you know, and it's about commitment and energy. And, you know, there are specific things I could go into, you know, depending on the situation, but it all begins with total commitment and mm -hmm. knowing that this is the only thing you can do. And, you know, dry, letting your driving desire take you to each idea that will get you further to your destination. Um, so it seems to me that, and I can get more specific if you want me to, but I think that the psychology of it is all born of commitment um, and just really that, that feeling of, I want to turn this dream into reality. What are the steps that I can take in this new world order? It's a whole thing. I mean, you can get onto Spotify, you can get onto TikTok. More than ever today, people can do that from anywhere. So That's right. the opportunity, there are no barriers to entry in this business anymore. And that is fairly new. Um, so it's, the opportunity is wider than ever 
for young people to achieve that if that's what they really want to do and if they've got the ability. Um, and that applies both to the artist and the manager. So I think it's that. I think it's commitment and drive and, you know, knowledge, reading Don Passman's book and studying the different forms of technology that can get you where you need to get, that can get you to the people. You know, that, 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 that is all part of commitment, isn't it? You know, being able to study those, study those, the, the vehicles that will take you there. And obviously on a management side, you know, my greatest advice, you know, has to be, you've got to choose the right artists because mm. as a manager, you are, no matter how good you are, you are only going to be as good as your artist. You can be the greatest manager in the world, but if you manage an artist who is okay or who doesn't have that Nick Jonas drive for greatness, um, you're going to do okay. But if you manage the right person, you can go all the way. And Kevin, you know that better than anyone. So as a manager, you've got to do all the things I said, but you've got to believe in that artist. You've got to know that you're willing to break down walls for that artist. And if you don't, it's the wrong artist. Yeah, so good. David, I can't tell you how much it means to me that you did this today. Uh, it's my total pleasure. Anytime, Kevin, I'll do anything for you. And I really love talking to you. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Love to you and your family. Give everybody just a big uh, hello from Papa Jonas. And the same to me, to you and Denise and the four boys. The best, the Jonas family. Thank, thank you, you very much for this. Bye. God bless. Bye-bye.